We've got a really great number of viewers today. Really excited. The chat's happening. Hopping happening. Jeez, I'm already messing up. John H. Kingston the third, you're back from Rockaway Park, New York. Bug Tank, you're in Soho. So am I. Mick Patterson, Chris Hansen, Andrew Duke, our regular. One, our, I, you, you've been to every single one of these, haven't you? Uh, with Tori Grossman, Paul Vanderwerf, our, uh, nice to have you here. And my good old friend Jason Sostek, BPMF. That's our, uh, our chat lineup so far. And uh, anyway, this is Techno Saturday, Selway Techno Saturdays. Um, it's a new thing for us today. Usually I'm, you know, just doing production stuff and making music and playing with sounds and arranging and talking about what I'm doing today. You know, it's more of a hangout and, uh, you know, it's techno friends. So every time we do a techno friends episode, we'll have a new, uh, guest to talk to. And today's very special guest is my great old friend and collaborator. Please welcome Christian Smith. Woo. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here and very happy to be able to contribute uh, to your show. You know, it's like I think it's very important to 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 do what you can and to educate people about what we do. And um, great that technology has given us the opportunity. You know, you're in New York. I'm in Europe and this we can chat cool, right? live. It's crazy. It's amazing. No, it's fun. And like, you know, we've been, you know, hanging out a little bit already this morning, just talking, getting ready. Cheers. Drinking water. Yes. Well, water. Figuring out, I'm, you know. I'm, 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 I'm doing sober October, so. Nice. I don't think I can. the liver. I don't think I could do that. I probably should at my age. <laughs> so, anyway, I'll remind everyone that, you know, we're here to talk today. And we will be doing some listening as well. We're going to go over some of our tracks we've done in the past and a little bit about our you know, productions and things like that. So, you know, we really want questions from you guys. Please interact. Uh, of course, I'll remind all of you, if you haven't already, to uh, to follow us here at 343 Labs, uh, to like or dislike. I don't care. Just we want to know how you're feeling out there. And, uh, of course, you know, sign up for the notifications so you know every time your favorite show comes back on that it's happening. And, uh, hey, Sotney, nice to see you again. We've got the It's All Techno Music YouTube channel in the house. That's excellent. Uh, and, uh, yeah, let's uh, – oh, before I forget, we've, we were doing giveaways. Uh, this week we have a $300 gift certificate or credit uh, for a class with us at 343 Labs, and we're going to announce the winner of that today at the end of the show. So keep your eye on the chat for information about that. And um, – Anyway, we are free, Christian. It's all up to us. Pressure's on. We got to put Pressure on a good show, right? Pressure is on. So yeah. We were talking a little bit earlier about sort of some of our older stuff from when we got started, and um, I actually have queued up here on Ableton Live. This is not our first track officially, but I'm going to say our first good track. And okay. it was never released. <laughs> and I'm not even sure I've got the name right. I think we, we just, actually, we just gave it a random name. And well, as, as it wasn't released, we, you know, we never yeah. really put much emphasis on names until we know they're coming out. So That's true. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Some people, like, that's actually a, a production thing or a, a, a productivity thing. Sometimes having a name in advance helps of course. focus of course. you at on what your result is. Totally. At least some kind of working name, you know, for the time being. But um, I don't think we ever had that. But hey, it still worked out. Yeah, no, we, uh, we usually manage to just get into the music for the sake of the music being good and then figure out our track titles later. So anyway, here is my Ableton Live. There's no, no big uh, arrangement or any, a bunch of clips to play with today, just this lonely track with a few uh, WAV files and MP3s that I dragged in. So let's have a listen to this, and we can, you know, we can listen and talk a little bit while we listen to it. BPMF says he wants it to be louder. BPMF, just turn your volume up. <laughs> Do you remember which synth we used for this pad? I think it was my Roland D70. I'm not sure. Wasn't it a Yamaha? Ah, uh, no, then it was uh, the blue Yamaha. Um, 
CSX. Oh, I think CSX something. Oh, it was man. blue. It had a few knobs. It was digital, but it was uh, one of those analog. Um, it was like a, it was an early virtual analog synth, right? Pretty much, yeah. From like, I think I, I bought it while I was at university in '93. It was one of my, one of my first synths. It was pretty good, actually. It had some, had some, you know, you were able to change the sounds a lot, and it was easy to program. I want to say it's something like the A1X or the A1NX. Does that ring what, a bell? Um, X. The, I had the first version, not the second one. Huh, yeah, okay. it was that one, yeah. I'm going to look it up. Because I like that synth. It was good. I mean, I use it for a bunch of tracks, and we use it as well. So, you know, it's... Where did you make this track? I think it was in Washington D.C. Somewhere or you were living. In New York. It was in yeah. D.C. It, you were? Did you have like an apartment in the suburbs was, or something? Or yeah, yeah, no, no. It was um, when I went to American University. It was in, yeah, in, 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 in my bedroom. I had a small setup, and and we made the track there. Yeah. Funny. And we use a uh, Nord lead as well. Uh, Nord lead one. There it is. Although mine was blue. Anyways. <laughs> Just the color. Save Techno says, sounds like old school. I love it. Well, we are a little bit old school, aren't we? Well, the funny thing is this track never came out. And I... Oddly, I feel this track stood the test of time. We really should have released it. Anyways. What? We still can. Know. Actually, we. I did. I'll be, I think I told you I put it on my Bandcamp. This is like a Bandcamp exclusive if anybody wants to grab it. Go for it. Now, we did one thing in this track that's... Um, it was a little dicey, I think. We used a sample from something. Do you remember what it was? Yes, I remember perfectly. But you know what? That drum loop later came out on a bunch of um, sample CDs and was even included as a preset on, a, on one synthesizer. So wow. You know yeah, we, we were a ahead of the curve. <laughs> Anyways, this drum loop was from a really cool underground Detroit record right. on Fragile. I forgot the name. Fate to Black? Fate to Black, no? See, now we're going to get in trouble because you said what it was. <laughs> For what? No, I know. You know it's like, I'm I think sorry. That it's Every Everybody samples. It's true. And, um, you know, it's, it's just a drum loop. And we we cut it in half as well, so it's not playing the whole thing. Yeah, but generally when you sample, always change it up. You know, you should never take um, a drum loop the way it is and just loop it. If you do, you know, and it's a famous record, you will get into trouble. So you need to be very careful. Tori Grossman. Ask for the link to this track. I just put that in the uh, in the chat for everybody if you're interested. Look at this. Now we're selling. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Oh yeah. And the track goes on for another five minutes. No, I know we're not. I, think... gonna, I don't think we have time to go through everything. I just want to acknowledge the chat again. Uh, Tori said thank you and also says Bandcamp is great for anyone in the chat. They respect artists every first Friday of the month. 100% of the revenues go to artists directly. And yeah, Bandcamp right now is the way a lot of independent artists and labels are surviving. You know, it's it's really a good platform to be on. Do you have stuff? Do you have electronic stuff on Bandcamp? I do, but we're just so inundated with other label work um, right. that we haven't really kept it uh, updated. But it's something I, I'm going to focus on, and hopefully in the very near future. Yeah, it's, but, that's the um, thing. You have to manage yeah. it yourself. Like with, with with regular distribution, it's like one aggregator, and like you send your you send your release out, and it automatically goes to all the different shops. Bandcamp, you have to do it all yourself. So, exactly. Exactly. I don't know. Are there any digital distributors that submit to Bandcamp or services that submit to Bandcamp for you? I don't think so. I think it has to be po possibly, but uh, yeah, I don't know. 
Yeah. It's, yeah, it's funny. It's like um, a lot of tech, like more underground techno artists obviously prefer Bandcamp much over Beatport. And um, well, yeah, yeah and but I, I, I still work mostly through Beatport. Yeah, I, I, you've got label works, right? Aren't, is, they have a pretty good setup with... Uh, are you using label works? I use them for uh, general distribution, but we do Beatport directly. Okay, yeah. yeah. You're, I, I'm lucky enough that my old label stuff is still direct on Beatport. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I got in early. Now they don't really take individual labels anymore. It's really, you have to be big. Uh, even then, I mean, I, I was just speaking to my label manager the other day at Beatport, and they told me they have 11,000 new releases every week. Good God. <laughs> uh, no, and it's like we always complain about Beatport and how, how they make mistakes with the genres, but imagine they have like two or three staff putting, you know, 11,000 tracks into different genres. Of course, you know, there are going to be mistakes. Right. And we, we all have different tastes. So what might be hard techno to me might not be hard techno to you. Anyways, it's It's, That's a, it's a hard job. People like to, to kind of diss on Beatport for their genres, but like it is a hard thing yeah. to do. I do agree. You posted on Facebook recently about uh, electro needs, like real electro needs its own space on yeah, Beatport I mean, and what, all the that, others. That, 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 Yes, I, that's just ridiculous that it isn't there. I mean, like, you know, how can you have 12 different styles of house, including organic house, <laughs> but, um, but not have a, a devoted genre for a musical genre such as electro? But, yeah, but which they predates told, everything else. But they, they got back to me and they said that they're going to do it. Um, they just don't know the timeline yet. Got it. Well, I'm really glad that some movement is happening there. Like decades later, it's finally happening. I'm happy about that. Hey, better late, better late than never. So, how's it going in the chat here? BPMF thinks my voice needs to be louder. Is it loud enough now? I just turned it up a little. Um, and Tori also is, con yeah, he's talking about Beatport and Spotify. They, they don't have terms that are respectful to artists. It is true, like, the, the percentages are pretty small. And uh, that's why Bandcap's so important. Very true. I mean, yeah, it's, if, especially Spotify, you know, it's close to impossible to, you know, you can make money, but it's, it's difficult. It's getting more and more difficult for all artists these days. And it's really tough times. And, um, but we just have to fight through, you know, oh, it's yeah. like, you can't stop. No, I think what, what we're doing right now, this is us continuing on to do what we need to do to like be productive and get the word gotta out. Got to stay on it, got to hustle and, um. It's, you know, if it's something you love doing, you should, you know, try to continue doing it. Yeah. So, and that's a nice segue into, you know, what we're doing here, why we're here. It's 343 Labs TV, 343 TV, and 343 Labs is a music production school, uh, in-person and online classes. Um, I, I've been mostly teaching online. I do a synthesis and sound design course. I do uh, private lessons. Uh, we have Ableton Live, uh, songwriting, music theory, uh, a lot of different... Uh, courses to offer uh, in our New York location where we st are still able to have some, some small classes in our space there. And then we have in Berlin now, things are going great uh, with the in-person classes at, at our new spot. And, uh, you know, we're doing this 343 TV series streaming every day, one o'clock, almost every day at one o'clock. And, uh, you know, just reaching out growing our community, sharing what we do with, uh, with 343 Labs and what all of us as individual instructors are into. You know, obviously, I'm, I'm, my show is techno-centric. It's not specifically purely only techno. Of course, we do cover associated genres, such as electro and other kinds of music that I'm into and hopefully you guys are into as well. To add to that, I mean, like, um, John and I have, I don't know, we've done 20 records, maybe 30 records, one or two albums together like we've done over 100 tracks together i've learned a ton from you it's like i've told you this before you know but i've learned so much from this guy and um, what an endorsement yeah. <laughs> thanks no, man it's, it's true i mean like you taught me everything from like arranging and like making sure you know that you you got you gotta switch your sounds a lot you, you gotta spend time on your sounds gotta make sure on big hooks, you know, these things are very important that, that stayed with me long after we stopped working together. And Absolutely. we still work together once in a yeah. while, but of course, there's a lot of things I learned from you that I really appreciate. Thanks, man. And I, I would say what one thing I learned from you was 
And this is something we talk about when we teach. So I always, you, and we talked about this earlier. I would always want to like tr use new sounds every time, try a new kick drum, try a new this, try a new that, and like switch it up and keep it moving. And that's important for your development as a producer and an artist to try new things. But there's also what, what you were always, and I think more uh, clued in on very early on was you continuing to use the good sounds that are working. And that actually, that becomes what we call your signature sound. So like, yes. you know, you reminded me, I always used to like, we used to argue about using the same kick oh, drum yes. over and over again and it was ridiculous. <laughs> and now I'm like, yeah. yeah, okay, let's use the same kick drum over and over again because that's our sound. We, you, and that's an important thing for people to learn is like, at, is at some point you should reuse your instruments and the more you use your instruments, the more, the better you know how to play them. So it's, and then also you help develop your overall sounds uh, that way. For, for sure. I mean, that's one thing people don't talk about these days is, uh, do you have your own sound? When, when, when you ask somebody that, they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I, I, make, I make melodic techno. No, it doesn't work like that. You know, your own sound is, uh, you know, that people recognize, oh, this is a John Selway record. This is a Christian Smith record. You know, that they hear a song and they can tell it's that producer. When, once you have that, that's a really good thing. But also, I got to add to what you said earlier. When we worked on tracks together back in the days, yeah, I mean, you used to drive me crazy. Um, <laughs> it's true. No, because, you know, you know, every time John and I went into the studio, we had to. He was very insistent that we started everything from scratch every time. Okay, so let's say we just finished a really good track. Amazing kick drum, everything perfectly EQ'd. Next track, okay, this, we can't use this kick drum again. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when we stopped working... I found a good kick drum and I used that for a couple of years. <laughs> but um, that's not necessarily good either. But I'm just saying um, a good mix between these two is, is the way forward. I agree. Speaking of moving you forward, know? let's move forward with another piece of music. I think this, this was like our first kind of big hit, like, you know, relatively to like, you know, techno. Um, we put this out on what well, the original release was on Intech, Carl Cox's old label. Actually, he's still doing Intech, isn't he? He started it uh, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It went, um, they stopped, they stopped it and then, then they called it Intech Digital. Oh, right. So, so the original Intech doesn't really exist anymore, but the mm -hmm. name still carries, carries on. And it was the Cosmopolitan EP, right? Metropolitan. Metropolitan. EP. And then we did the Cosmopolitan. Same, same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, have to, I always, mostly I've deferred to Christian on track titles for our, our projects. We would just, I wouldn't even care. We would just make our music and then he would think of a name and I would say, okay. Anyway, let's, let's check it out. It's Move. Should we talk about the track while the track is playing or should we just let It seems to be the, th you already started talking, so you just ruined it. Yeah. <laughs> And um, yeah. Anyways, this track came out in 1999. It was the first track on Intech, which is Carl Cox's label. And um, it did really well uh, for one reason, I think. Um, it was a complete crossover record. We sampled a, a disco track. It took a small snippet out of a disco loop and we just looped it. And um, a lot of different people really liked this track. Um, it's the only track I've ever produced, and I think same for you, John, that um, Jeff Mills played it, um, but also Paul Van Dyke played it, uh, Danny Tenaglia, you know, everybody from house to trance to techno played it. It was, it was pretty pretty amazing. And, and Sasha, of course, who, who was a big, he still is big, but back then he was like God. Um, <laughs> and he was really God of the progressive world. Right. And, um, and him putting this track on his Ibiza Global Underground CD made the track grow even even further. It was yeah, a very, very interesting experience. Yeah, this, I think, I was always, and I still am, really proud of this track because for different reasons. One, because we got away with it under the circumstances that we were under. So luckily, and then two, for what you were just talking about, how... It, we somehow managed to make a track that was techno and house and progressive and trance and all of the above that crossed over without compromising. We didn't do this on purpose. We did this because we enjoyed it and it, this is just how it came out. And there's an energy in this track that 
came from the fun we had making it. And then also, we can talk a little bit about the state of mind we were in when it happened, I guess. It's nothing too crazy, but... No, it's just, um, you know, we were both in our early 20s in New York City. And yeah, we partied hard. We had a good time. We, we drank a lot. And most of the time when I came to your studio, uh, John used to live in Chinatown in New York. You know, he had a small little setup below his futon bed. You know, it was tiny. Yeah, I had, I, I had like a, um, a loft bed that was barely yeah, tall enough to stand under. <laughs> Exactly. It was tiny and stuffy. But you know what? Um, and we, we usually were horribly hungover. But um, we made our best tracks like that. You know, go figure. I know. It's just... And I'm pretty sure... I know we did this track on a Tuesday because the Monday night before, we were out at a Tronic treatment. Right? Uh, that's funny. Yeah, I'm that, sure. That's very, very possible. And yeah, for, you know, for... for some it so, makes me laugh. Anyone out there from New York who's our age will know what we're talking about. But Tronic Treatment was Christian's regular Monday night techno party for years in New York. And we had a lot of amazing people come through there. Pretty much like who's who of techno at the time would play there. And it was small and crazy and so much fun. Like really, like that was a really formative time for, for me. Yeah. I mean, this was a, yeah, a Monday night party, and uh, for 100 to 120 people, we had everybody from um, Adam Bayer, uh, Derek May, DJ Hell, tons of tons of people coming through, and it was free. So we did free entrance, yeah, and it was just good fun. Yeah. It's like, you know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah, keep the music running, but it's a little bit lower and acknowledge the chat again. I think... We need to scroll up a little bit. We got a lot more chat rate, like a faster chat rate this time, but I want to make sure I don't miss anybody. Um, who's here? Thanks. Lee, Lee says the sound is good. Begonia and Mike are here. Sleepy and Boo. Of course, Christian, you know them well from New York. Of course. Really glad that they're, they're around and still doing things. Hey, Caesar. Oh, nice, to, nice to have you here. And uh, Cool Vapes, welcome. House this house here. Keon, hello from the UK. Yes, very glad we have a nice uh, wide international audience happening today. We've got uh, It's All Techno Music. Uh, thanks, uh, Chris.84. He says Turbo was an amazing track. That's one of my solo tracks from that era that came out on Ultra. And it was. Uh, William Mindreader says I play it as well. Love it. Thanks very much, William. And. Uh, Let's see, William also says, Metropolitan EP on Intech. I miss this techno tribal period of you all, as well as Detron, Brian Zentz, and a lot of others. Detron and Brian it? Zentz, those are guys that we know well, yeah? That's, uh... Yeah, I mean, I mean it, 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 was a, it was a really fun time because techno was evolving and changing really fast. You know, it's like now, right now, for example, you have a, a couple of styles that are very popular and everybody's pushing those but back then everything was mixed together and um it was all intertwined and people were experimenting much more i would say than they're today so yeah it was it was very fun days uh, you know yeah have you uh i saw detron in new york a couple years ago he had a gig here which was at an unfortunately uh not very successful party but i I think that was the first time I ever met him in person. It was cool to just oh, wow. hang out with him for no, a little bit. I, I've been friends with him for like 20 years. And um, and I see him I don't know, once, I, once a year, every two years. And we're still in touch. A very good guy. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he went more into the soulful house thing. Right. But but obviously he always, he, you know, he has techno roots. So, so, you know, he recently made like 136 BPM techno tracks. So he... Yeah, I know he still he, does it he, every now and then. I listen for those. He he know he knows what's up. He's a very good producer. Brian Zenz, um, he's not no longer in the industry. Yeah, I was but, about um, to ask you about him. Yeah, he was very talented too. I mean, he wrote really big tracks and really good and um, groundbreaking tracks like D Clash and Intac was was huge. But um, a very yeah. nice guy too. Back in the days when we were still around DC, um, because he was in Norfolk, Virginia, right? So that's right. Yeah. And I remember the first time I met him, he. He came up to me at a party and said, "Hey, I'm Brian. I have a demo tape. Can we listen to it?" And we we went to I was driving my parents' car 
It was like an, some kind of <laughs> Oldsmobile or something. And like the... I, I had know. an Oldsmobile. Yeah, from, so it was from the <laughs> 80s, but I was driving it in the 90s. It was a very... Not the coolest car, let me tell you. But anyway, <laughs> it had a good sound system in it. And uh, so he got in and we listened to his tape. And it, I think... I don't remember exactly which tracks they were, but they were good. And it was all of his... I think a lot of it was his early like Barada stuff that he did for Definitive and like, and like, I realized like I was like, oh, this is cool, but it wasn't exactly what I was into at the moment. But I I knew it was good, and but I never got back to him about about you know whether I would want to like put a record out with him or something. And then um, years later, I was like, oh yeah, he was he played that. The, I would listen to a record and go, I know that he was in my car in like 1993 or something or 92. But in those days, you were more into the more more into the harder techno. Things. Oh, exactly. Yeah, I mean, so, you, know, enough, you know, you know where I, I, you know, I've always I was into harder techno. I still am. I've always been into lots of different kinds of techno. Of course, of so course. stuff and, we did yes. together, like working with Ali and Sharam and doing like the deep dish, the first deep dish record, which is you know fully you know proper deep house, right? And then yes. doing weird electro with Jason Sostek, BPMF, and ambient with the Rancho Relaxo All Stars and Abe Duque and Jason and a bunch of other guys, and then. I've always been all over the place stylistically. So, but yeah, the hard stuff, um, you know, getting into the, the rave scene in New York in the very early 90s, meeting Oliver Chesler and doing Disintegrator and, and uh, putting out records on industrial strength. And I think, if I recall correctly, when we met first was back when you were still called DJ Neuromancer and you That's played right, at yes. a rave. It was like a pretty empty warehouse there weren't a lot of people there in dc i played That's live right, and i did like a crazy hardcore live uh set and i think that's where you first said hey i think that's where we met that's where we met yeah it was it was like an illegal rave um yeah in 93 or 90, 92 i don't remember it, had, it would have to be ago. the very early 90s yeah and i was at university in at in washington dc and yeah and that's when we became friends and then a couple of years later we made a track together and we had a pretty good chemistry i think and so we continued doing it and then we had a i don't know i don't know what was our what was our first commercial release i don't know it, it was Maybe on it rotation was i was on rotation okay yeah. great i was rotation. i was, was looking for those files there i there i've got to have them somewhere that was that was a really good single rotation is a uh, uh, Dave Angel's label. Right. Dave Angel is is an absolute legend um, when it comes to melodic techno from the nineties. He's like I should say the Carl Craig um, of England, if, if that yeah, makes any I mean, sense. He's still around, I think. And but yeah, he's I still think, around. Yes, um, have, we're, we're both. I think he's we're both on this Facebook group, Real Techno. He's on there. Yeah, he, he's a huge. Um, hero of mine I, uh, idol i really idolize this guy i you know yeah, he's was, the dawn for me when it comes to melodic techno yeah and i i go back and listen to those records and i agree there's there's something real special about them and that actually that relates to a question that we got in the chat here from save techno and he's talking about techno from 10 15 years ago was great each song sounded different from the others now all techno sounds the same what do you think about that now, I think you have to go further than 10 or 15 years to really. But what, what would you say, yeah, Christian? Yeah, you know, and, and, yeah, I, I see what he's saying, and um, he's partly right. But like what John said, this has been going on for a long time. This is not just um, the last few years. But right now, you have this, I should call it, um, disposable melodic techno that is very possible, uh, very, very popular. You know, it's like mm. hard, hard distorted kick drums, and um, a big melodic break, and then after the break, it's just drums. It's just a very predictable arrangements and um, very uh, soulless melodies. All Not right. always, of course. There's always exceptions. There's always, you know, that that's why you know a lot of people business uh, diss the term business techno. And um, I like small business you know, techno it, now. <laughs> you know what? I, I really couldn't care less. You know, if if music is good, it's good. You know, and, and sure. there's good. There's good commercial techno, uh, uh, just as there's good underground techno, and there's shit commercial techno, just as there's a lot of shit underground techno. So, you know. I, I um, think it hasn't, the ratio of good to bad music hasn't changed. It's just no. more of it. There's more people doing it. That's, that's all. 
and techno is more hyped now than sure. it has in a long, long time. So there's a lot of attention onto techno now. A lot of people that were doing tech house, commercial tech house and um, deep house are suddenly now making techno because they think they can jump on the bandwagon. As some actually do yeah. successfully. Yeah. But um, yeah, because a lot of people have their eyes on techno. And the more commercialized, uh, the more popular sound gets, the more commercial it gets. It's, 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 normal. it's normal, yeah. And yeah. I also, I take kind of a view of certain styles of music develop a certain way because of their external forces, like market forces or even practical or sp space. You know, there's, there's a reason certain tracks sound a certain way because they sound good on festival sound systems. True, true. And when you hear those simple stripped down productions that have, it's just like beats and then a hook and then beats again, that works great on a huge rig. And, but listening to it by itself out of context, it's not, you know, it's not as interesting. Well, but if you listen to like some classic melodic, funky Detroit influenced techno that's sophisticated and has all the stuff going on and it's developing in interesting ways and compositionally, you know, that's a whole nother thing and i wouldn't even compare them almost like i wouldn't you know and i'm not going to diss one or the other i'm not going to diss business techno or whatever it's just a, another world but you can still put the two together i think well, you sure know, you can you can make a track interesting in not it doesn't have to be innovative but interesting original and um good sounding for big clubs and big festivals mm -hmm. and um you can do both and yeah. i think i'd like to think that's what we try to do because I don't think totally. I, we're not completely uh, innocent from doing something like business techno. You you have to admit totally some agree. of it, like you know, we put out records on drum code. Uh, like we we're we're not. I'm I'm not a purist. I like all kinds of of techno. Sa sa and sa same here, same here. And you know, Tronic, my label, is um, fairly big as well. And I've also released some more commercial releases. And you know, what? I'm okay with that as long as it's good. It's good. Mm -hmm. And um, just one thing I don't like about the techno scene right now is there's a lot of hate going on, and um, especially the purists, you know, the people who think they're cool and underground. Mm -hmm. They're like, as soon as you release something on one of the bigger labels... Uh, but you're not cool anymore? No. But I, and, and, there's and, always and, and, been and, people like that. Yeah, no, 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 but let me give you an example. Um, don't name any names. I'm not gonna say, uh, no, of course not. Uh, I sent a demo. I recently made some some tracks that are really cool, techno, underground, you know, like proper, you know, I have roots like you, and I know what good, deep underground techno is. And so, and I made a couple of those tracks and I sent it to the label. And he said, yeah, you know, quality is amazing. Tracks are amazing, uh, but I don't know. Basically, because you you're too big. Don't. <laughs> because I have been, no, because in his eyes, you know, oh, this guy has released on these labels. It's not a cool image for my label. There is that. There's it's, definitely it's, it's, a lot. There's image conscious. There's fashion. There's but you know and what? In, things any, come and in, go. In, yes, and in any in any industry, there's problems and whatever. But I don't really look at this as a pro as a problem. I do what I love. I do what I like, and that's it. You know, it's like yeah. I think we're know, both so. similar in that way. And we're both very lucky that we managed to, um, you know, have this pay for our lifestyle and, you mm. know, and we can make a living doing this. So Definitely. Let's just check back in with the chat a little. Um, sorry, I have to scroll up again. There's a lot going on in here. Robot Dharma. Hey, welcome back. Robot Dharma says Neuromancer sounds 90s. Yes, indeed it was. And uh, let's see. A lot. Uh, Tori's really got a lot to say today. Thanks. Uh, I think you should also try going off the Beatport charts. Do you mean not listening to the Beatport charts? I think that's what he means. And I would agree. Like, uh, if you only choose your music based on what other DJs are charting, everybody's going to yeah, sound the same. And I think that does happen. Of course. Of um, course. Of course. Predict William Mindreader's predictable arrangement. That's the summary. Thanks. Last drink. Ha ha ha. Yes, exactly. And small. I, someone else likes my the small business techno. I'm trying to. <laughs> who's uh, <laughs> small business techno? Is uh, Andrew it's Duke great. said like that for that. the first time? Andrew, I think you said that in in another stream, and I, I I've been borrowing that. I want to give you the credit for starting that. Let's all hashtag that now. Um, if, if you guys ever happen to like help us out and repost, and you know. Feel free to add small business te hashtag small business techno when you repost my streams. Um, Begonia and Mike depends on what techno means to everyone. Yes, I agree. 
Bodega Techno. I think we've done some of that. That's what a what Robot Dharma bo- says. He's joking around. Bodega Techno. Okay. I mean, think about it. We lived on low, I lived in Chinatown, Lower East Side. We would like be hung over. We'd go get some, like, oh, yeah. something to yeah, drink yeah, from yeah. the corner bodega <laughs> and then go in and then like bang out some techno. That's totally Bodega Techno. Uh, all good, all and, good. Uh, Anyways, let, 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 let's get back to uh, talking about production. Oh yeah, we will. And I, we have. I'm also looking for those questions. There's a lot going on in the chat today. Okay, okay, Someone okay, okay. Asked. I need to find out who it is. What, what gear we used back in the day, and we did talk about Keon. Welcome, Keon. What hardware did we use back in the day? So, pre DAW, like pre audio in the DAW pre like virtual synth, you know, we were, we were using computers to sequence, right? What did we mainly use as a sequencer? Cubase. Yeah. Cubase at first. And then, yes. uh, and then that became Cubase VST pretty soon in the nineties. Like I, I started, I yes. jumped on the VST and virtual synth train pretty early on. Very early. We even got into using no, like sound Sony SoundForge acid to do like loops and stuff, which is sort of a precursor to Ableton live in terms of working with loops and audio. But you and use fr- fr- uh, Fruity Loops, no? We, that was we, I would use Fruity used. Loops to generate like patterns and then turn those to audio and then drag those samples into SoundForge, Acid. But, back, uh, but, uh, but, but one thing I got to say, back then in those days, those programs were so, so um, inconsistent. Yeah, they would true. crash. It, would, it was a pain in the ass back in the days yeah. to make digital music. It really was. Your computer would crash. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, would, you know, it was a that's nightmare. That's why we were still mostly using MIDI. So I think... Thank um, God. <laughs> so Cubase would be sending MIDI out. We had an Akai, uh, S, I had an S3000XL by the late 90s that we were using for samples. Uh, that's what mostly our, our samples were on. I used this rack mount Yamaha RM50 drum module. Um, Move, in fact, what we were just listening to, the kick drum. It's not the greatest kick drum in the world, but it worked for that track, and that came from the RM50, and we used that on a bunch of tracks. Um, and what else? The TX81Z? I didn't uh, have Yamaha. one of those. I didn't have one of those. I had, I, I, you, I had one of you those. You had one. But, uh, we um, use the Nord yeah. lead a lot. A lot of our synth lot, sounds, yes. when you hear like leads or pads in the, those like late 90s, early 2000s tracks, there's a lot of Nord lead. Um, awesome synth. I never had a really great mixer. We always had kind of a... I was using a Behringer mixer for a while, and it was just okay, but it, it had a sound to it somehow. Like, it worked. I don't even I remember. Think it was a ma- I think it was a mastering guy that, that well, always, made it sound right. better. <laughs> the fact that we were mixing on half-assed monitors under a bed in a small bedroom in a tiny apartment, like we were working at a great disadvantage. Getting a balanced mix back then was not easy. And, not easy. Yeah. What, what, what is funny, I, I attended a few cuts in, in London at the exchange with um, Simon and with Nils, two legendary um, mastering engineers Nils has sadly passed away anyways and they told me as long as you have all the elements mixed more or less right they can fix it they can mm-hmm. add more mids they can add more highs they can put a general compression and our mixes thankfully had that so in the end they ended up sounding pretty good yeah i think what that means is you know now that i know more about mixing and mastering like they were adjusting for the frequency response and of the room we were mixing in, basically. Our levels were good, right? Like, relative to the room we were mixing in. And then the mastering engineer could hear that and hear, okay, they got too much of this and too much of that, and then they'll just EQ it and hear it in their perfect environment, and then it sounds balanced again. I think that's pretty much what was going on. So and that's what's really and, important and, 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 about... Yeah. Sorry, just to, just to educate yeah. a little bit for anyone new out there who's like... You know, should I master it myself? Should I use one of these online services? I think the best thing you could do if you're really learning how to get a good mix and you're ready to go to mastering is give it to pay for a person who knows what they're doing, who's got, who's trained, who has the right gear and the right monitoring, who knows what they're doing, to like listen to what you're doing and give you feedback. It's it's even if you never release it, like you know, instead of paying 30 bucks or get free mastering with an app or something online, spend a hundred bucks or 70 bucks or a little more for a track from a real good mastering engineer just to learn. I think that's a valuable thing. And you'll know what's, what you need to fix. And then you can go back and mix, change your mix according to that, what you learned from that uh, experience. Um, Just checking the chat again. There's so much going on today and I don't want to, I don't want to leave anyone out. Um, 
there's just too much going on. I can't. We're just going to totally get caught up in reading this. <laughs> this is the most chat we've ever had. So, wow, this is a milestone for us. In fact, I just got a little message from Restraint saying, congratulations, you've received 100 messages today. So no wonder I can't find anything. Great. And Great. Um, let's see. I guess we were just talking about gear. Uh, there's a delay that we used a lot that sort of like it was a signature sound for us especially with tracks like move it, uh, what was it again it's the digitech rds 36 i found a picture of it i still have it it's broken i keep going i, I don't know if it's worth fixing but uh, probably not it's probably cheap to buy you can probably get one for like 100 yeah, bucks I on could, ebay if, but then you know? again like i've got plugins that blow this thing away now like there's just no it's noisy <laughs> It's like, it's, this was a cheap delay back then. But what was cool about it, I mean, if any of you out there that are into like inexpensive hardware that's cool, that has character, you could pick one of these up probably for like 30 to 50 bucks. Um, and, you know, it's, I don't even think it's a true analog delay, but it sounds kind of like an analog delay. It has some grit to it. And it has a CV input in the back. So you can remote, like you control the delay time from like any CV out from a synth or like modular gear that can that can provide you that signal and you can do some really cool modulation with this so anyway just a and it has like a, a certain character and like it has a really rough mid-range sort of ear piercing character that we used like we would do build-ups and i would and yes. i would um i would enhance the feedback of this thing so like you know, you turn the feedback up and you hear the echo get more and more and more and more, but it would it would stop at a certain point. I would actually do a true feedback loop. I would go into it, out of out of the delay, back into the mixer, and then send in another signal to itself to make even more uh, feedback. And then I could actually, I would uh, tweak uh, it had a parametric mid-range on the, the Mac, uh, Behringer mixer, and I would actually play, the, just tweak the frequency going back into the delay and that a lot of the the flavor of move actually is when you hear these kind of atmospheric rhythmic delays sweeping up and down in the track we do that in the build-up for example and this was also a classic thing back in the days to use a parametric eq on, on the mixer on everything i mean yeah yeah i mean yeah but these days you know that doesn't happen at all well, it's all, I mean, it does, it's but... Just a, it's just an easy, it's just a quick go-to. Instead how of, can I, how can, yeah, you how do can it if you track, play live. You know? People out there that do hardware techno, that dollless techno, that play live with a mixer, do stuff like that. And then... Fair enough. And yeah. in the box with plugins, I will automate a filter with, with an envelope, and it's kind of, or you assign a MIDI knob to tweak. And I actually, I'll use Live's EQ8 in a similar way to the way we used to just tweak the mixer. So, but yeah, it, that, back then, that was your only choice if you wanted that effect, unless you had a lot of, yeah. in a big expensive studio with lots of effects on everything. Um, and the Mac, the Mackie was really good. The parametric EQ on the Mackie was, was awesome. Oh, the, you, you had that. the big 32 channel one, right? In your... No, no, no. I didn't have money for that. I, I had, um, I thought you had a big mixer at one point in your old apartment. No, I had I had, I had a twenty four channel. A twenty four, okay. Well, yeah. well, <laughs> you couldn't afford the thirty two, but I, you got the twenty four. Yeah, yeah, but that was another fifteen hundred dollars extra. It was expensive that, back then. That is true. Like, yeah, but but that's another yeah, nice, nice thing nowadays is that the barrier to to get into this is much lower now. A lot of it's totally it's a lot more people can get involved. Um, the only pro, the only thing that I find though that. Um, that uh, producers use too much are sample banks. You know, it's it's like mm. you hear tracks that people basically just cut and paste the whole track, and um, obviously that's not the way we learned to to make music. We had to actually build stuff from scratch. Well, we and, did. Um, we would we would dig for samples. We would like, yeah, of course, just like from you records, know, sample records, and like yeah, of course. Like we we learned how to sample from like you know, hip hop and industrial music and like early. Or Electro. other types of early electronic music that used samplers, you know, previous to what we were doing. And you'd actually, you know, get the record out and needle drop and find the little piece that you want and record that and then put it in your sampler. And then, yeah, so it was a different, it was a, like a, a more steps to jump through to get to the unique sound. And my, and my suggestion to all of you out there, try to make a tracks not using any sample banks. Sure. Yeah, for kicks, for individual sounds, fine, but not hooks. Do your own hooks. Right. Because you know, and if if you don't, if you don't, you're never gonna you're never gonna learn how to properly produce music. And and just to make the obvious connection to three four three labs, if you're if you feel like you don't know how to lay down a melody or play something unique, 
or make the sound that you want. Well, that's why that's what we're here to do for you. That's what 343 Labs is all about is uh, teaching music production, teaching music theory, teaching all the things you, you need to know to be a more confident and creative musician. Uh, let's listen to some music again. There, I know there's some uh, other it. stuff going on in the chat, but let's, let's try out another piece of music. Which one should we listen to? What do you feel like listening to, Christian? Total departure. Oh man, yeah, okay. That's that's definitely obvious. But that's you that's know. our that's <laughs> our all time biggest record for sure. I think Move was actually bigger, but um, well, this one was also. We'd have this to, one was more. This one was more groundbreaking. You know, it just blew people away. You know, I guess Move would. You have to kind of relate it to the times. Like, it was easier for a record to sell a lot in 1999. Very true. And Total Departure originally originally was released 2010? 2008. Oh, eight, yeah. I think. It, it was right in the middle of the big minimal wave when right. everybody was making like 120 BPM, very slow techno. Which and, we did um, too, honestly, to full disclosure. Yeah. And again, we like everything. We like everything, and you, you also, I don't, I'm not saying you should follow all the trends, but you have to adjust a little bit as well, you know, you, you, if you, you know. Well, yeah. that goes back to what I said about music being influenced by the environment that it's in. Exactly. And, you know, if you're out there and you're at parties and you're hearing this music, you're influenced by it. Or, you know, if you're a DJ playing in these venues and you're seeing how your crowd, crowd is reacting, or if you're a producer and you're making music for those same people, you want to sort of represent what you're into but also make it uh interesting for everybody somehow like it's finding that balance between sort of your artistic idea and what you're really into and then if you you know reaching a bigger audience i guess yes but my whole point bringing this up was that total departure was right the opposite of what was popular back then well, you know, if, if you, minimal was really popular well, back then, the, and then, listen, he, then the, we just released like this techno banger. But listen to the beginning. If the track only did the intro for five minutes, this is like this of, groove that we're listening to right now is it's got this little swingy, bouncy bass, minimal groove with the little blippy noises in it. But then it goes ballistic. So you're right. It uh, becomes the full on techno that we love eventually. And the track is 12 minutes long, so I suggest you skip in a little bit further, because... <laughs> this will just take us right into the end of the show if we let it go. <laughs> exactly. You're right, let's... Uh... No, th th this track takes like five minutes to, to really get going. So. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna suddenly skip through. Here we go. Damien N says, that pluck is so minimal. I agree. I feel like this is us playing with it. You know, this was like, we're going to take this whole minimal thing and then go, you know, like just twist it. So, so the story behind this track is that um, John and I heard a track that used a plugin similar to this, but just once, once in a while sporadically. And uh, we liked this so much. So we said, hey, fuck it. Let's build a whole track around this plugin. So we use it. Um, well, I forgot. Do you remember the name of it? Uh, it's it's part Something? of this. There was a bunch of plugins called the Endless Series, and it's, it's, it was called Endless Tone. Yeah, Tone, and it was like ten dollars. Um, and we we distorted the sound. We we com we compressed it. We we worked a lot on it, yeah, and then we just built a track around it. And um, this is it. And basically, the break is very long. It's like three minutes. And yeah, just... Shall we, shall we skip reaction. ahead a little bit? Yeah. All right. And if you, play, if you play this at a festival or a big club, even a small club, just, people just go nuts. I still play it once in a while. It doesn't really fit into my sets sometimes, but whatever. You well, know, you did an updated this. version of this, right? You did like a, a yeah, harder yeah, remix. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I did, but I went back to playing the original, to be honest, huh. because the, the original is better. What to do? I, I tried to improve the original, but I didn't. You know, the original is better, so it stood the test of time. William Mindreaders mentions the name of the guy who made the, this plugin, Ali Larkin. Okay. And it's, um, 
Thank you, Ali. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Batman motorcycle? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's it just, sounds it's, like, a, like a cheap computer game, doesn't it? Well, it's, it's just right, a right. sine wave at first, but I, we put a lot of distortion and effects on it. So it's creating exactly. this illusion of endless rising, but we're also making the sound more intense as it goes on. So it's enhancing the effect of that rising of, uh, illusion. And then it drops really well. The bass comes back in really well. I always wanted it to stay heavier longer, though. I feel like it goes down too quickly. I think it's just right. You think it's just right? <laughs> I wanted yeah, like a little more noise. <laughs> yeah, but you always. Uh, but this is the good thing when we collaborate because you always want. You always like to have the filters all open. Uh -huh. And and I like it more close. <laughs> so it's, it's you know it's a collaborative effort that results in this track. I think. It's like. I mean, at this point, if you're a DJ, you're already bringing in the next track, right? You're keeping the energy level up with another track, yes. so it makes sense for yes. mixing. Yes, as well. So, yeah, that's okay, pretty much that, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Is it? It's like a transitional kind of genre crossing techno track. Like, it's literally starts minimalistic and then goes totally full on, and uh, it's playable like in a harder techno set when you speed it up. Or you can, you know, use it, like, if you're playing a minimal set and you really want to, like, blow everybody up all of a sudden and just get everybody who's, like, in their, like, trippy zone to, like, wake up, that would that would do it. <laughs> That's one thing I'm happy about right now. Techno seems to be getting a little faster again, which, sure. which I think is a good thing, you know, because techno and techno 125 BPM, yeah, it works, but... Um, it should it really should be in the 130s in my opinion you know it's like it's, but hey everybody has their own opinion but i like 134 136 or you know anything 130 upwards sure. it's just until up to 140 it's like some guys do they do 145 for me it's hard to find a good groove um at that speed yeah i f at that level you know when you're getting into that fast of a tempo i want to start hearing half time at that point i want to start hearing it like <laughs> You know, like, the, I want it, I like, I, you know, it's kind of like you hear in drum and bass and other styles of music where there's like a fast and a slow rhythm at the same time. Actually, uh, yeah. Max Wilde did a, a, music, a Music Theory Thursday episode recently about half time and double time, which is, anyone interested who doesn't know what I'm talking about, go back and watch that with Max. And, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit again about, before we're done, about uh, 343 Labs and the shows that we have um, I don't think we have anything going on tomorrow. Sometimes we do feedback sessions. Monday, we've got uh, Tips and Tricks with Doll Trick. Uh, Tuesday's a hybrid studio. Um, it's, it's, his name is Justin Beck, but he uses another name. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Mr. Beck. Uh, we have... Um, oh, no, Tuesday, I'm sorry, is, is Tetro doing his, uh, his Tetro talks? I've got to memorize the schedule. This is embarrassing. And then we have the hybrid studio, and we have... Uh, Theory Thursday with Max Wilde and Friday, my very another very good old friend of mine, Abe Duque, does his basics. Uh, and then again, it comes around again for me. And next Saturday, uh, we're going to be looking on at uh, I've, a, a, a plugin that I've had, but I've never used. I have all the Arturia stuff. Um, and they have this kind of preset-oriented plug-in that's really easy for everybody to use analog lab you know and you can get it with like hardware and it works together and it's pre-mapped and it's 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 a really great entry into making music with lots of different types of good quality synth sounds and i'm going to do a little bit of like let's see what we can do to make interesting techno coming with using presets like how do i make presets sound unique how do i make my style of techno with when i don't have a lot of if i'm not like making all my sounds from scratch what what do you do and i that's that's what we're going to cover next time. So hopefully and, you guys can our, come back our, for that. Arturia is great. I really love the plugins. Oh yeah, so we've been using good. those a lot in our more recent uh, productions. I, I, we've been using more of that. And um, but what is that Berlin company? Yuhei or something like that? Yuhi. Um, 
I think it's Yuhi, Uhi, Uhi or Yuhi. His, his, very good that, as well. That stuff is amazing. Very, very good, yes. I've been, uh, I think we used uh, the, um, he's got the sequential circuits clones that he does. There's like a Pro 1 and a, a Pro we 5. We used the Pro 1 a few times, yeah, yes. Yeah, and those are, I love it. They sound amazing. It's like, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, you can do everything inside the box these days. Of course, having the hardware is nice to have. It's amazing oh, yeah. to t touch the touch the knobs and, of and tweak them. And you have to spend more time getting the um, the plug-in sound perfect. But you can have you can have warm analog sounding stuff straight out of the box. Absolutely. And that's amazing. I love that. It's yeah. fantastic. And, you know, I have some hardware here. We, we, I have some gear. We did a live, sh we set up a live show a couple years ago and did a couple, did we, we just did the, the one gig, right? Because things kind of fell apart after that in the world. Well, we were but... supposed, we, yeah, exactly. We were supposed to do a few shows now during COVID and, um, and we were supposed to do a big show in Australia in January. But when the but fires happened. The bushfires happened. So that festival got canceled. Bad luck. But anyway, hopefully we'll come, we'll come back next year. I, I, I just I have gear here that we use for that, and I've been using it a little bit, like incorporating every now and then. I'll bring a synth out and record something, and then. I'll, but I always go back to in the box. I'm so like my workflow is so oriented with the Able Ableton Live workflow, and uh, it, we're almost done. We're at 157 already. I do want to acknowledge the chat wow. again and make sure we don't miss uh, any interesting or important questions. Uh, cool Vapes asks, "What do you think about room acoustic treatment or not? Should be mandatory for making a good track." Um, there. Are, <laughs> you, ideally, you want to have good acoustics. Um, I'm in my living room right now. Uh, this it's it's a decent sounding room, but it's not a good mixing room. Um, and but it's possible to do with if you have good monitors and you learn to adjust for the room. Uh, another thing, you know, if, if room acoustics is impossible or out of or you can't afford it or you just can't do it in the space that you're in, you know, very good enough headphones can be good to mix in and i use something called the uh, sonar works reference which applies a, a acoustic correction to the and makes the response of the headphones a little flatter and it makes it makes it more so you what you hear is accurate it doesn't make it sound better it makes what you hear in your headphones more flat response so like if you set your bass level you you're not hearing it boosted or cut by the headphones you're hearing what you actually did and so i think that's good uh, it's saved me a lot. I've, I've actually had improved mixes in being in a non-studio environment using these headphones with Sonarworks. So. But, but yeah, if you're a reasonably new producer and uh, let's say you want to buy yourself a, a big Moog synth, invest the money in acoustic treatment because it's, I think it's really, it's one mistake I've made many times, uh, you too. Um, you know, if we would have had the chance, we would have, you know, gotten proper acoustic treatments because then you can actually hear everything you create otherwise mm -hmm. you can't you know, I, you know like if i was starting a new building a new studio somewhere the first thing i would do would be treat the room yeah, <laughs> to make it course. sound as good as i could and then figure out based on the space and size and the acoustic treatment of the room what speakers work best in that room i mean you can buy exactly. the speakers first and then treat for them but that's the, the monitors and the acoustics of the room if you're looking for accuracy that that's what you do first but that said, there's plenty of good music done out there that in bad environments, in headphones, you can learn to produce well in how, wherever you are. Totally. Um, let's see what else we got in here. Uh, they've announced, I missed it, they announced the winner of our gift certificate in the chat. Our good friend Andrew Duke, who's been with us every step of the way from the beginning, is this week's winner of $300 uh, credit with uh, 343 Labs. So congratulations to Andrew. That's great. Um, someone asked, where is Christian Smith from? I perceive a non-English speaking accent. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's a long story, but I'll try to keep it as short as possible. I'm half Swedish, half Norwegian. I spent the most time of my youth in Germany. And then I moved to the States, to America. I finished high school in America, went to university in America. Then I went, uh, then I moved to Sweden, uh, to, to graduate school. And while I was in graduate school, I produced music and then I became a DJ producer. And um, yeah, that's it. Nice. So half Swedish, half Norwegian. You're just like Mr. And, Global. And, 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 and I lived everywhere. I lived in Brazil for four years. I lived in Spain a couple of years. Uh, yeah, lived all over. 
global citizen, right? Yep. Well, I took advantage of the fact that uh, when you're an international DJ, it doesn't really matter where you live as long as you're close to an airport and you can get to your gigs. Right. So uh, I, I really thought about that early in my career and took advantage of that. So, so I moved to different places and, yeah, and, and enjoyed living there and learning a lot. Excellent. It's been really great having you. Um, thanks very much for agreeing to do this. I mean, you know, we talk all the time anyway, so it, this Anytime. is just like, you know, you know like... We, 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 get, we, we get online and chat and catch up with each other. And um, let me just, actually, one more thing. Let me just quickly ask you, what have you got next? What's happening next for you and Tronic? Uh, Tronic, um, we have three releases a month, so there's always a lot of stuff coming out. Um, and I have a single coming out on drum code actually in three weeks, October 26th. Oh yeah. I just saw that promo. Uh, and, um, yeah, I, I've been very active during the lockdown. So, yeah. so I, I haven't stopped. I've continued the way I did before. And I think it's very important because I think a lot of promoters will judge you with what you did, um, during the non-touring season. Not just that, but I, I just like to have my flow of life because if I would yeah. cut everything, I, would, I wouldn't know what to do with myself, you know? Like, so go, go work at a so. bank? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, but, but if things don't get better soon, I, I might who have knows to look into that happen. too, you know? Yeah, who, who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> but, I'm but, happy but, that I got into teaching. You know, I kind of semi-retired from being a DJ. Of course, I've never stopped making music, whether I'm collaborating with you or all the other things. And, but getting into teaching was like the, was a great choice not knowing that all this was going to happen like you know and meeting all the guys that you know most of most of who i work with at 343 labs we were you know coming from dubspot and dubspot was a great community to be a part of and to get into you know i, I learned how to be a teacher working at dubspot and uh it's this is amazing uh, it's been really great to be a part of this so thanks max for ha bringing us all together and um yeah let's uh i guess this is it for today uh, once again, thanks to everyone that joined, joined us in the chat. I, I'm not going to name everybody right now because there's just too many of you today. I really appreciate <laughs> all the uh, activity and the viewers that we have today. This has been really fun. Uh, please do check back with us. Uh, subscribe. Uh, get the notifications. Hit the like. Tell your friends. Tell your family. And uh, keep following us here at 343 TV, 343 Labs every day. So that's it for now. Uh, see you again next week. Adios. Bye-bye, everybody.